my ladies, and ladies justice can't ask me whether there was any evidential basis that Scots would have been well aware of the risks, and I, I gave an answer. But what I should have done was point out that there's a specific factual finding to that effect in the judgment. Thank you. It's for your reference. It's at three hundred and thirty-four, and where the judge says. Mr. Thornhill would have been aware, for example, that his actual client Scots were themselves highly sophisticated and likely to have been fully aware from their experience of promoting tax avoidance schemes and the issues to which they gave rise, the risks associated with them. So I'm sorry, I didn't. I, I, I apologise for not. No, it's actually quite a difficult judgment to pick one's way through sometimes. Thank you. Hmm. Same question. Yeah. 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 Which is the, the second area uh, in breach in, in which criticism is advanced, on, uh, which is advanced under seven heads. But the most important one is the end side of breach. And uh, the, 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 the big point that is advanced against Mr. Thorne is that he should not have applied the end side of breach. And, and the end side approach essentially involves approaching trade in a film scheme. From, from the top down instead of from the bottom up. So if on the facts the taxpayer is going to be joining in what is an existing film trade, in other words, will be carrying out part of an activity which inherently is a trade, then it is not necessary to reanalyze from the ground up whether that activity is a trade or not. Instead, you say, <coughs> right, this is going to be a trade, but I need to check whether it's denatured by the terms on which it's being carried out by this particular entity. That was exactly how Mr. Thornhill proceeded. You can see that clearly from his opinion. And the judge concluded at, uh, for your note, 219, that that was a reasonable approach in 2002-2004. Now, I, I just want to give you the critical path to the judge's reasoning, which in my submission is obviously right. First, the judge said, look, this approach is directly supported by Ensign. And he was right about that. Ensign had been decided only 10 years before Mr. Thornhill advised. It was the leading authority on tax avoidance film schemes at the time. Mr. Thornhill had actually been involved in it. I think he was in front of the commissioners, but um, he, he was, he was, he'd started it off as a say. And you'll find it in Authorities 2, at tab 15. I know you're under enormous time pressure, so I'm really sorry to interrupt. Just help me if you would tab 18, the actual opinion. Could you just... Sorry, tab? To tab 18, the actual opinion. Of, of which bundle? Uh, of tab oh, one two. Two, Mr. Thornhill's opinion. It's completely my... Just say that he adopted the ensign approach. And he does that. I'm just rooting myself, Mr. Ed. I'm sorry to slow you down. So he starts, he says, there's no doubt trading. Um, Warner Brothers activity being passed over, that's inherently a commercial activity. Um, it's not really, a, it is separate, um, separate activity. And over the page, he deals with Lupton. And then he goes on to say, in my view, the correct principle was an ensign. And you say this is the, and this is the, some of the of the relevant analysis is that right? Yes, which is not a criticism. I'm just asking to make sure I've got the facts right. So well, it's 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 the bit at the bottom three yeah. three nine. And so that, that in my is opinion, the, the current position in law is that if the taxpayer carries on commercial activity, etc., etc. And you, so that's you say that's top case. down. That, so you say that's the top down approach, do you? Yes, uh, one has to. Remember, um, Sorry, just. To well, I I really do hear times winged chariots at my yes. back at the moment, but um, the. You have to have to read it. This is a highly compressed opinion, which in which Mr. Thornhill has been asked on by that 17th of January letter to put together an opinion which brings together and answers all the questions which have arisen and been given over the whole course of the months of dialogue with his client Scots. And uh, you can see, and it, he, he always said, that, that, you know, you, you can see from writing this the way that I'm, I'm just banging out answers, as it were, to questions. I don't set the questions out. I don't, it's not done in the narrative style of I'm instructed by these effects. He's, he's referring to the memorial, which contains a great deal of information. So it is compressed. 
but you can see the thought processes very clearly. First question, is it trading? No doubt it is. In my view, there is no doubt that it is. Why is that? And then he is unpacking why. And he then makes a series of points which are you know, related uh, but separate. They bear upon each other. So he starts by saying, look, Warners do it. He doesn't say, and, and Warners are trading, but that's kind of you know, inherent within the sentence. That's being passed over to the LLP. This is inherently a commercial activity. Then he turns on to whether, it, the, the, whether it's carried on in the same way. Then he turns out to whether, whether it really is a separate, separate part of it. I mean, all, all these sentences carry with them a penumbra of other um, thoughts and possibilities. But it, it, is, it starts there and reasons its way through, essentially starting from the premise, as he says in the first few lines, that Warners are doing it, it's trading for Warners, it's an inherently commercial activity. Now, is there anything wrong with taking that approach? So, is, is it past the Livingston test? Uh, he says, yes, it does. Uh, are there parallels in the real world? Yes, there are. Can, and then he says, is there something artificial? Uh, can it be denatured under Lupton? Uh, he says, no. Uh, he, he, and then when he says the correct principle is followed in Ensign, that is a reference to the denaturing, which was gone into, I'll show you this in a moment in Ensign, said it, it's, um, that's not right. Lord Templeman had no doubt that the partnership was trading. The real issue was about the expenditure. And then he says Lupton arose again in first sense has been quashed in the Court of Appeal. So he's carrying through a, a kind of completely logical but very compressed tax thought process. And it's it all starts with the, the proposition at the beginning in the first paragraph that Warners are doing it. What they have done is being passed over to the NLP. That's inherently a trading activity. So that's top down, it's an inherent trade. Now, um, in, if we have Ensign at Tab 15, authorities 2, tab 15. We can see how this is directly supported by Ensign, that thought process. And the first important point is the lack of impact on trade of motive, because um, HMRC directly took the motive point and they lost. And you can see that at the bottom of 419. The revenues relied heavily on Lupton because this house held that tax avoidance is not trading. Therefore, as the court submitted, the tax avoidance scheme in the present case is not trading. So it's just very simple. You're a tax avoider. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You're not trading. And that was rejected. It's rejected over the page at letter C. Uh, it's rejected at page 46 in, in a, a, what became, I don't think still is quite a famous, though it's probably fading out of fashion, a famous dictum at 46 at D. My lords, I do not consider that the commissioners of the courts are competent or obliged to decide whether there was a sole object or paramount attention, nor to weigh fiscal intentions against non-fiscal elements. The task of the commissioners is to find the facts and apply the law. So, uh, Mr Thornhill could proceed, as you see he did, on the basis that tax avoidance can be traded as long as the activities justify the result. And, and, and that, by the way, is, is the answer to my learned friend's sixth point in, uh, about equivocal transactions. Motives are jolly important when it's equivocal. If you can reasonably take the view under Ensign that it is not an equivocal transaction, then motive doesn't matter. And that's what Ensign establishes. Okay. If we then turn to the question of activities, because what Lord Templeman has said is motives don't matter, activities are what matters. It is really noticeable there's almost no analysis in the House of Lords as to what activities the partnership had been undertaking. There is no multifactorial analysis. There is no list of the badges of trade. Do we tick them? Do we not? It's just accepted that since the partnership had put money, real money, into making and exploiting a genuine film, that was enough. That constituted film because that was in and of itself a trading activity. And the relevant passages were quoted by the judge at 201 to 202. 
I draw your attention in particular if you've still got 426 oh, 426 of the bundle, that is. Yeah. Where uh, what Lord Templeman says at letter E is the production and exploitation of a film is a trading activity. The expenditure of capital for the purpose of producing and exploiting a commercial film is a trading purpose. So these are categoric pronouncements, or seemingly categoric pronouncements, at, at, at any rate, strong pronouncements. There was no greater analysis than that other than at 4298B, where he added, a trading transaction can plainly be identified, Victory Partnership expended capital in the making and exploitation of the film. That was a trading transaction. It was not a sham and it could have resulted in either a profit or a loss. Now, I'll come back to profit or loss when I deal with speculation. But mm -hmm. there is just no detailed ground-up analysis at all in this case. What, what they did was look at the documents for the purpose of seeing if they were on such terms that they denatured what was otherwise a trade. And, and they said that they did in relation to the element of circular funding, which uh, my lady, Lady Justice Henry Ward, knew about and I'm not going to go into so exploitation of IP in a film is, is, is essentially stated by the highest appeal court 10 years before Mr. Thornhill applies to be a trading activity. And Lord Templeman was no friend of tax avoiders, as Lord Justice Henderson observed. So this looked to any reasonable tax lawyer like a solid foundation for that proposition. The proposition outlined at the beginning of Mr. Thornhill's opinion, uh, if you are doing what uh, a studio does, you're putting real money into the exploitation and production or distribution of a film, that's a trade. And, and so the, the judge's conclusion that uh, Mr. Thornhill's approach was supported by Anderson was right. The, the, the next point in the judge's critical path was he says, well, that means that going ground up, and you're doing all the stuff it says in the manuals, uh, start with you know, looking at, at what's happened, do it in a really detailed way. Just, it, it, that's distinguishable. You don't have to do that if you're a reasonable silk, if you can follow this approach. And he said that uh, that, that, that followed. And, and he was right about that. And it's important to remember that this is a situation in which the LLP hasn't done anything yet. So it's not like the shipbuilders or whoever coming to you and saying, okay, this is what we've done the last year or six months. You've got to analyze a whole load of facts to work it out. They haven't done anything. It's all perspective. It's all a document exercise for uh, Mr. Thornton to do. The third critical point in the judge's reasoning was, said, OK, you couldn't do this today. But the reason you couldn't do this today is because the courts have changed tack. And that couldn't have been reasonably anticipated by Mr. Thornhill. Now, that is right, and that is really important, because after Ensign, so it was 1992, Mr. Thornhill first instructed in 2002, so you've got, you've got a decade, and into that decade comes the Gordon Brown legislation, my learned friend referred to, I think, on day one, uh, with Section 42 and Section 48 specific release, and that led to the creation, as my lady, Lady Justice Simmel, was well aware, of hundreds of sale and leaseback partnerships which were waved through by the revenue as trading. And they were waved through even though they were taking no risk, conducting no activity, receiving a fixed income stream, using the income stream to pay interest on the large loans they'd used to gear up their involvement. Now, those S&L partnerships were a really significant feature of the film tax landscape in the early 2000s. Where does the um, sorry? Where are we in the judgment? He said, um, the judge rightly rightly concluded so this in couldn't have been foreseen. Forgive me. Two 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 eight. Thank Stance you. to ask the question. Thank you. So but basically, the uh, uh, two to six, two to seven is the then sign establishes this, and then at two to eight he says. Well, you know, should, should there have been, should, should, he have, should he have anticipated a change coming? And he starts by saying, 
by saying, uh, uh, can, can I, 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 let me just finish on what I was saying about SNL and then I'll come, come on to this passage. So what seemed established at the time that Mr. Thornhill advised in 2003 was not only through Ensign that the exploitation of film rights was in and of itself a trading activity, not only that fiscal motives did not affect that conclusion, but also that the practice of HMRC, illustrated by the SNLs, was to accept minimal activity and no commercial risk in film exploitation as amounting to a trade. Now, then we pick it up at 228. And at 228, he observes... Sorry, this. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. No, not at all. Um, I understand what you're saying about what happened over the course of the period afterwards, but are you saying as at 2002, there was a practice of the revenue to wave through? Well, uh, yes, I am, because... So where, where's what, the, is that dealt with in the judgment? I, I, I think that the... the, 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 the it's what it's the way it's dealt with in the judgment. I think is by reference to the plain vanilla. Right. So the plain vanilla isn't published till two thousand and six, and the judge gets that wrong. My learned friend yeah. can point a bit of that out, now, and he's right about that. Well, two 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 nine, you get a, a flavour of it, don't you? Yes, you do. Because he says um, that um, it is the nature of the objections. No evidence the revenues approach changed exactly. in the period two thousand and two two thousand and four. Mr. Thornhill pointed to six. Film that's in the years afterwards. Uh, what, what I was it you you said a minute ago there was a practice yes. at the time yes. of uh, waving uh, through. That was my point. I understand that in the period afterwards. You, you're absolutely right, my lady. But the, 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 what I'm relying on is the fact that you know, the, the section forty two and section forty the section forty eight release were created, I think, in nineteen ninety seven. They, they, they came in very early. It's all part of Cool Britannia, yeah. and. Uh, the, the SNL partnership started mounting up. Um, there, there's a, 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 and so by the time, so five years on, for Mr. Thornhill, you know, the, the, there was already a pile in the queue of, not in the queue. The, the, there was already a pile of SNL partnerships. And, and two th the point about the 2006 vanilla is that it, what it does, it just kind of, it's the revenue saying. You know, this is this is how these work. There is a two thousand and three. <coughs> there's a two thousand and three statement by the revenue, I think in authorities five, uh, which is much much more compressed by, than than the vanilla, but it is on you know on the on the same lines. We gave the reference in our skeleton actually. Supplementary 63, I'm grateful. Well, don't turn it up. I've okay. taken you out of your Take, course. So that's that's right. Thank Supplementary 63, that's a July 2003 revenue statement. It's only for a page or so. Thank you. But it, it gives the indication, acknowledging that the SN, SNLs are going on. Yeah. So, back to the judge's reasoning. Yeah, right. He, he, he says at 228, look, you learn about what challenges might be made in the future by looking at what challenges have been made in the past. And at 229, he says, that doesn't mean you, you try to think of everything. And then he derives support for Mr. Thornhill's position from three factors. And first, he says, as my Lord the Chancellor just pointed out, that there was no evidence that HMRC had changed its approach to how to attack partnership schemes. Well, I mean, it's implicit in that. I mean, you may not have been able to find a reference to, to it. I, I don't know. I can't remember now whether there's anything in the judgment about hundreds of sales or lease back. But it's implicit in that. The policy of the revenue in 2002 was to wave these things through, or was, to, was not to raise the trading point. Exactly. It's, it's not raising the trading point. It's not it's to raise the trading point. They, they were not. They and hadn't changed. Says, well, they didn't. There's no evidence they changed their uh, their approach or their practice. And he goes on to find that that the change in practice doesn't take place until much later. Much later. So he he says first there was no, no change up to 2003. Then he looks at some post 2003 support, mm -hmm. saying, well, you can st see they still haven't changed their their practice. And there he points to the three cases: Halcyon, Microfusion, and Icebreak. And, the, and it is of real significance that in none of those three cases did HMRC say not trading. So just to, to take microfusion, which I, I think my lady Justice Simmer had some involvement with, 
The decision was in 2008, the, the, the tax year was 2005, and my memory is that microfusion had essentially just been inserted into the studio with Pathé, and it had been shoved into Pathé structure. And, and so it was taking on part of Pathé's trade. And there were lots of issues in, in the case, but no point was taken by HMRC on whether there was a trade at all. They took the point as to whether it was the right sort of trade, i.e. was it a trade in exploiting films, but it was common ground that microfusion was actually trading. Yeah, it was so, all about the master version. Who yes. held the master version? Yes, exactly. And I, I, I knew you'd know more about it than I did. Um, Scarred. Scarred. I did another scar, I'm not doing scarred. well. Um, the, the point is that the judge says that this provides backward support for Mr. Thornhill, if I can put it in that way. It shows that in the years after he advised, HMRC was not taking a no-trade point. So how could Mr. Thornhill anticipate that the ensign approach of going, look, it's exploitation of a film, it's trade, was going to change? Then he points to the plain vanilla, and he did get that wrong in the sense that he, um, you know, he said that he could, he could draw support from that in 2004, and he's wrong about that. But he could instead have drawn the sort of backwards-looking support he drew from the cases. Because when you look at the plain vanilla, you can see quite clearly that it does provide support. And, and since, I mean, I, look, it is a mistake, and I'm not trying to say it isn't, but in 229, you can see he's saying, these three cases provide post-event support. And then he starts by saying some further support is to be found in the bill. And I suspect that he, he knew, because it was common ground at the trial, this was published in 2006, we, we all knew it, but it said so. He was probably going to do another, and this is more backward support, but then he lost the chronology halfway through. But if he, instead of saying what he said, that it was um, available in 2004, you replaced it with a sentence along the same lines as the ones in the previous paragraph about microfusion and halcyon. So this does provide some support for the conclusion that the revenue had not changed its approach in 2006. Then it's, it's unassailable. And, and of course, as my lady, lady Justice Sinner will know, the, the plain vanilla is directly contrary to anybody ever thinking that HMRC would take no trading. Because the, the, the plain vanilla is riddled with features which are now regarded as highly objectionable. It, the, the plain vanilla sale and lease partnership does nothing apart from buy rights and sell them straight back. It has no ongoing involvement with or control over the film. It gets a fixed return which is known from the very outset of the transaction. And it takes no financial or commercial risk at all. And the BIM actually says, uh, in the vanilla example, and, and I quote, that it produces the same result for investing partners whether or not the film is successful. Now, my learned friend would say that was clear evidence of a lack of trade being carried on on a commercial basis, and that probably would be the modern analysis. But those were HMSC's own words in 2006, and despite that, the vanilla expressly states that the partnership in question is trading. And my learned friend's answer to this on, I think, day one, would say, look, this was just, this was a special thing about Section 48, so of course it's, it's given special treatment. But the point here is that trade is a question of fact. You can't say, HMRC can't play fast and loose with fact. It can't say, okay, no, we're going to, the partnership doing nothing, taking no risk, no control over here. That's trade because we like that to be trade because we're encouraging the application of section 48 release. Partnership over here doing exactly, with exactly those same features. That's not trading because we don't want to encourage that. Okay? That is not the way uh, that HMRC can operate. So, that was the position before Mr. Thornhill advised. That was the position after Mr. Thornhill advised. And it was only much later, as my Lord the Chancellor observed, that it all changed. And where it changed was in Eclipse and Samarkand. Now, we have not been able to find ever a single case in which HMRC challenged trade in a film scheme before Eclipse and Samarkand. They are the Fonzet Oregon, not one. And I, I think that must be common ground by now. And I just want to show you quickly the seismic shift that happened in the authorities. Could we put away Ensign if we've still got it open and have authorities two, uh, authorities four, sorry. <clears throat> uh, 
and it's at tab 29. This is Eclipse. I think Samarkand was actually decided at first instance before Eclipse, but Eclipse reached the Court of Appeal first, so I'll take it in that order. <coughs> Authorities for <clears throat> tab 29. And if we go straight into page double one, double four. <clears throat> so, yeah. Eclipse 2 was another entity that had been inserted into an existing studio structure. I think it was Disney in this case. So we're right in Ensign territory. And this is uh, 2015. <laughs> and at 106, you see. Mr. Aronson's default argument was the simple proposition that the activity of entering into a license and sub-license was in itself a trading activity regardless of any facts and matters. That's it. That's the core argument being advanced. And he cites a loan authority which, of course, culminates in, in Ensign. That's the Ensign approach. And now, the Court of Appeal disagreed. If you look on at paragraph 148... Uh, paragraph 148, uh, on page 1153, we turn finally to the other way in which Mr. Harrison put Eclipse's case, the namely, that the acquisition of the license with a view to the rights and the sub-license itself with a consideration with a view to profit constituted inherently and as a matter of law carrying on a trade. And we disagree, and then they distinguish, they cite the relevant bits of Ensign at paragraph 149, 150, and they, they distinguish it on the facts. Now, it doesn't matter for my purposes whether the argument was right or wrong. This, this is a professional negligence case. And the point is that this argument was still being run in 2015 in the Court of Appeal by a very eminent tax silk. And what this demonstrates is that more than a decade after Mr. Thornhill had advised, a leading tax silk felt able to press that same approach, the inside approach, as his core argument about trading. But the reason it was rejected was not you need to do a grounds up exercise and look at the badges of trade, and the reason was that they didn't pay for the production, and the reality was they didn't make any contribution towards exploitation. That, that is the... Um that is the outcome by the time it gets to the Court of Appeal. Of course, at first sense and on the way up, it's been refined by the time it gets to the Court of Appeal. So if we then look at Samarkand, the next one in, in the chain, which is the next tab, conveniently, and we look at page 1172, and Samarkand was a, a, a sale and lease back where they tried to comply with the vanilla. So there was a certain amount of taxpayer outrage that, that, that they were, weren't, weren't being given the relief. Uh, but you see at 52, oh, on page 1172, uh, there's a mention that the purchase and onward leasing is at H to J. The purchase and onward leasing of a film were transaction of an essentially trading character in the same way as BNBF. So he, 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 Mr. Furness relied on BNBF. And if you look over the page of 53, he says... Uh, the result of the fiscal incentives, it looks artificial. None of this should be allowed to detract from the inherently trading nature of what the partners actually did. And that is then rejected by the Court of Appeal, that they are, they, they reject them. Just while we're here passing through, just at 1179, note paragraph 80, where uh, the Court of Appeal says, look, badges of trade, neither here nor there. But, but more importantly, for my purposes at the moment, uh, you, you look at paragraph 59. Sorry, I took, took you past it. It's paragraph 59, at page 1175. It says, these submissions were attractively presented by Mr. Fenness, but I am unable to accept them at the most basic level. It is now clear from Eclipse, if it was not before, that the question whether the tax whether what the taxpayer actually did constitutes a trade has to be answered by standing back and looking at the whole picture, a cross-reference to Eclipse. Uh, and and it, it, it goes on to say that 
Mr. when Mr. Furness, and, and then, sorry, at B, it says, it follows it can never be appropriate to extract certain elements and view them in isolation as determined of the issue. That, in essence, is what Mr. Furness is inviting us to do when he says the purchase and lease back or onward lease of a film are inherently trading activities. And he says, no dispute that it's capable of forming part of a trade, uh, but you've got to look at the whole picture. And this is where the phrase multifactorial evaluation comes from at letter D. The whole exercise which the FTT has to undertake is one of multifactorial evaluation. Now, that statement, it is now clear from Eclipse, if it was not clear before, is, I would respectfully su suggest, a clear judicial bit of code, tacitly acknowledging that it wasn't actually really clear before Eclipse, but they're jolly well nailing it down now. And again, my point here, in a negligence case, is that the inherently trading argument, which is the essence of Ensign, was being run again in 2017 now, nearly 15 years after Mr. Thornhill had advised. And then the last in the trilogy is de Gaulle's, uh, the facts of which are really remarkable, but unfortunately I don't have time to explore, which is at uh, Authorities 5, tab 31. So it's the first authority, tab 31. And so it, it seems that the revenue bar was slightly struggling to accept the idea that nothing could be regarded as inherently trading anymore. And so they come back to the world for the third time. And at page 1211, unfortunately, they ran into Lord Justice Henderson again. And and 49 is in the absence of a statutory definition. It's not surprising there's a lot of case law about what constitutes a trade. Uh, much quotation by the courts below. For present purposes, it's sufficient to concentrate mainly on the decisions of this court in Eclipse and Samarkand, because that's the ones we just looked at, each of which post dated the FTT decision. It, as it happens, both cases concern film schemes, so there are substantial differences between them, and they're different from this one. The significance of the two cases, in my judgment, is they provide an authoritative and recent restatement of the principles which should be applied in deciding whether activities undertaken by a taxpayer constitute a trade for tax purposes. And then a, a little later it goes on, it was common ground that at least in this court, these are the principles which must now be followed. Although I should recall, recall that Ms. McCarthy reserved the right to take it further that his, the taxpayer's activities were inherently of a trading character. So this is the third time in two or three years that eminent tax service have argued the ensign approach in the Court of Appeal. They are arguing that some activities just are trading. It's inherent in the activity. You don't have to look any further. And that is, again, a, a sound guide, I would suggest, to the reasonableness of Mr. Thornhill 15 years before, looking only at Ensign without these authorities in front of him, and saying, right, Lord Templeman has said, this is a trading activity. OK, let's turn to denaturing. Uh, it is a significantly different approach that is exemplified in Tagorse and Samarkand <coughs> and Eclipse. The multifactorial evaluation is now the new load stuff. But that is a restated approach which must now be followed. It was not reasonable to expect Mr. Thornhill to, to see that coming, and it is unreal to pretend <coughs> otherwise. So this is the judge's core reason behind his findings that Mr. Thornhill's approach was reasonable. That it was supported by Ensign it, it was supported by what was going on on the ground. In particular, you can see that from HMRC practice as evidenced by a lack of ever attacking a film scheme on a trading basis. And you can see the lurch in a different direction recorded in the fossil imprint of the law reports. Now, if that's right, and it is right, then Mr. Thornhill was perfectly entitled 
to express himself in strong terms. He was perfectly entitled to say, in my view, there is no doubt that this is trading, if the ensign approach is reasonable. Where did the judge deal with the uh, degree of confidence? <coughs> Did the degree of confidence expressed by Mr Thornhill in his decision. Before I shout out the number, I'm just going to go to check that I've got it right. I'm sure you Yes, 338. Thank you. I was going to say 334, so... <laughs> <laughs> I, I got it wrong. Three, paragraph 338, paragraph 140. That's up page 140. I was actually... I'm glad you've gone there because... Um, at some stage, I'd like to just look at paragraph 227 and 2336 because it goes back to this fundamental question of how the judge dealt with, as I see it, the, the strength of the advice because he split. He, he, he seems to have said, right, well, it was, um, he was entitled to take the view per ensign that yeah. this was trading. Yeah. Then separately, not as part of the same exercise, was there a duty to warn? No, because... Um, of the nature of the um, investors, but 336, if there was a duty to caveat, then there was there would have been a breach because uh, there would have been a duty on Mr Thornhill to give a warning specifically related to the satisfaction of the statutory tests. Yes. Now, it's just a question. If, if the judge was wrong to separate out duty to warn and to bring this, cons this latter consideration of um, risk of satisfaction of statutory tests into his consideration of um, the uh, advice that, that uh, or the view that there was no doubt, um, would that have led to a different result? And, and, and has the judge actually here in his judgment tackled head on the criticism that the Mr Thornhill was not entitled or was negligent to say no doubt? I, I think that the judges. Um, answer to that is at 338. So if it was reasonable to reach the view that the tax benefits would, would be achieved, I do not think it would be negligent to express a clear and firmly held view to that effect. Pro and then he says, provided that you don't do it in such a way as to negate or undermine an accompanying risk warning. So the, the, the judge, what the judge has done is say, uh, in, in the passages we were looking at, he's saying that this, this was a reasonable view. Uh, to, to, to take the ensign approach. The consequence of the ensign approach is that you, you, you say, right, this is trading inherently. Uh, is it denatured? And then he says that entitles you uh, non-negligently to express yourself firmly. But, but, but to, would, even this would necessary would not necessarily constitute negligence if accompanied by an appropriate risk, risk warning. Now, the opinion stand alone didn't have a, a risk warning. Uh, well, that is true. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, that, that is true, other than in the sense that uh, it, 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 because of the nature of the client he was advising, the, the advice is tailored to, to Scots. But, but we're now... When we're looking at breach, the counterfactual here, we're now looking at the, the warning aspect. Hmm. The counterfactual is, no, you're advise, advising investors. So, uh, Albeit well, sophisticated investors with his IFA. So, so his first reasoning is, well, you don't have to do anything different anyway because of whom, whom you're advising, who are sophisticated, and, and who have got their own advice. I mean, you know, they could reasonably expect to have their own advice. So that may not have prevented the duty from arising. But as I said before, with the lunch and adjournment, it... Uh, assists with understanding the scope of any duty to war. And the judge's first conclusion is it doesn't make any difference because, because of the nature of who they are. He's then saying, well, if I'm wrong about that, and there was a duty to war, well, what should have been different? And he says it was fine to say, to express a firm and clearly held view, that that was reasonable, but it had to be accompanied by the, the risk warning. So what he's, he's saying is, not that the words used were, were negligent, but that they should have been accompanied by some further explanation. And it's at 3.40 that he sets out the three elements of, of that risk warning. 
And that's actually going to be really, I'm, I'm, I've am got, got to save myself five minutes of causation or 10 minutes of causation at the end of this, because causation is actually an incredibly important point. Yeah, but you just, because I'm conscious that you are galloping somewhat. Sorry. I'm not blaming you. I'm conscious you, you're, you're aware that Mr. Stewart must have time to reply. Yeah. And we have discussed this, but we would be prepared to sit slightly later this afternoon if that helps. Well, I'm enormously great. Both of you to stop as it were, feeling you have to gallop through stuff, which is really quite dense um, and quite difficult. And we, I mean, we will sit till quarter to five if need be. Beyond quarter to five, we like to start getting. Can, can I just say, Mother? Hungry we and did. Thirsty. My, 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 my little friend and I did agree beforehand that we would divide time equally. I did cut my cloth in relation to it. I'm very yeah. pleased. Well, I'm aware of that. Mr. Stewart, I'm just this, making the point. This is bit. what helps the court, Mr. Stewart. I'm, I'm very good. And I'm, I'm not interested in complaints. This is what helps the court. Uh, I'm grateful to all. I, I, I won't try to take it on very much. Yeah. So you right, say sorry, you, we, I'm we, not, I'm we, sorry, I've now lost the thread. No, no, we, 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 what we were on was, was the risk warning and the thought, the thought that was going through my mind. I don't know whether it's the same as my lady's point. Was it? The, the difficulty of all this is the moment you put in the risk warning, you change completely. The, the, I mean, you can't say, or well, I gave this categorical advice. But the moment you put in a risk warning with a categorical advice, you say, well, uh, I very firmly of the view that X, but I ought to warn you that I might be wrong about that, and the revenue could take a different view. Yeah. What you've then got is something that's completely different. Well... I mean, the, the, there are three heads to the risk warning that the judge said should have been given at 3.40. Uh, he says, first is, Mr. Thornhill should have said three things. He said, first, this is not exactly covered by authority. So you know, it's possible that other people might take a different view. That's mm -hmm. the first point. He said, secondly, I base my view on trading, on the challenges which HMRC have made to date. You know, in other words, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking back. At what the revenue have done on film partnership schemes. Uh, and, then, and then the third point is there is a risk of investigation, especially if you really push the boat out and try to avoid a lot of tax, that if HMRC changed their approach to challenging film schemes, that might be different. So that's what he held as the appropriate risk warning. Now, my submission that actually doesn't completely change no. the advice. I mean, those are, I don't in any way mean to be disrespectful to the judge, but those are relatively platitudinous propositions. Now, others may take a different view, is, is unfortunately a hazard of professional life. Uh, yeah. The fact that my view is based on what HMRC have done up until now is, is true, but isn't really a, a much of a warning. In fact, if anything, it might give confidence because one might read it and think, Great, right, well, okay, so they've never done this before. That's good. Uh, that's actually a positive, really. And then the third one is to say, look, if, there's a, uh, it, if there, there is a risk of investigation and if they change their approach, you know, we're all up in the air. But that is pretty much, I mean, uh, uh, a, a, that is itself meaningless. B, the point the judge makes about, well, if you stick in an absolute shed load of money, then you, you, you're going to alert the revenue. That's really not for Mr. Thornhill to advise on, I'd suggest. That is something well, that... Well, those second and third points really pick up on one of the, on what the ambassadors were warned about in the, in the risk Absolutely practice. Because so. the whole point is a point that we put to, to Mr. <coughs> Stewart on day one, I think, which was the, the, the whole point about saying, well, this is all predicated on the revenue accepting the accounts. What, what they were, what that's really talking about is accepting, amongst other things, that this is trading. Yes, exactly. So it falls very much within the category of stuff they've already been warned about yeah. before. It also falls within the category of stuff that their IFAs ought to be covering. And, and the IFAs don't get airbrushed out of the picture mm -hmm. here. Uh, they still remain very relevant. Yeah. And, um, I'm, I'm not challenging the judge's formulation on this, because if we, we reach this sta stage in the analysis, um, which I say we don't do, because there's no duty, there's no breach, but if we, 
get to this stage, then that is actually, I would suggest, a fair encapsulation of the appropriate warning. But it doesn't make any difference in causation terms. And um, I, I want to come back to causation because that is a, a separate topic. But just to give you the absolute headline, because we're thinking about it now, the, the, what the claimants pleaded always, their consistent case was, we needed a warning which said there is a significant risk of a successful challenge. And that's what they've got to establish here in order to succeed on causation, you know, right, right down at the end. And that is a very considerable distance from the warning which the judge has held was appropriate. And what it shows, and, and this is uh, in answer to the, the point that my lady Justice Carr has been um, pressing upon me, which is that the case against you is you shouldn't have said no doubt. Now, I'm, I'm defending no doubt because that's reasonable within ensign. But let's, let's assume that he shouldn't have said no doubt. Or he shouldn't have said, here, I see no difficulty. But he should, should have said something lesser along the lines of this. He should have said, well, I think you know, nothing's free from doubt, but I think it's a good case. Or, um, you know, you, well, some of the examples that I gave earlier, I think, I think this is a strong case. I think they've got good prospects, something like that. It's weaker than no doubt. But it's not negligible. If that's your conclusion, that you, you were to say, well, look, Mr. Thornhill really shouldn't have said no doubt, but he'd have been perfectly entitled to say, I think this is a good case, if that's your conclusion, then they all fail on causation. Because that is not a significant risk of a successful challenge. That's what they need to establish for causation. Can I go back into... Um, where we were on yeah. ensign. So as, as I was saying, if you can adopt the ensign approach, then that is a complete answer to my learned friend's statement that there should, we should have said that there was no doubt. Because the whole point about it is it's inherently trading. And that is strongly supported, I would suggest, by the matters I went through in relation to what was happening at the time, what happened afterwards, and the way that it was still being argued. 2015 to 2017. So this is all hindsight. So that is ensign, and I'm going to move quite quickly, but I hope not rattling through the, the remaining points, because I've covered quite a lot of them already. So the, the second point is that they failed to apply the Livingston test properly. And the Livingston test is that they don't carry it on in the same way that people carry it on in the real world. And the judge considered that argument and he rejected it. And the argument that, that they put forward was all based on the risk re reward ratio. Sorry, I've got that tangled up in my mouth, but I hope that came out on the transcript. Uh, and, and the judge says at, at 224, but it's perfectly reasonable to think that the issue of how the profits are going to be divvied up is not relevant to the issue of whether the activity is being carried on in the same way. And, and the judge was right about that, not in the sense I'm saying he's right about it as a tax proposition. I, I don't have to go that far, but it was a reasonable view. Uh, there was no case in 2003 which said anything different. It didn't, there was nothing which said the way in which people decide to allocate the fruits of their trading matters. And so Mr. Thornhill can't possibly be accused of negligence for not taking that view here. And, and, and if, you, if you think about it, you know, if you think about the, the famous shipbuilders in, in Livingston, if, if one of them had said to the others, look, you know, I, I've got you know, lots of small children. I don't want to be risking all my capital here. You guys can have more of the money than I can have, as long as you promise me that I'll get £100 or whatever out of it. So he's sacrificed profit, he's, he's got his guaranteed income, which he knows is going to enable him to pay off whatever he wants to pay off. The, the judge is saying, well, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't affect, that doesn't mean it's not being carried on in the same way, just because there's a different balance of risk and reward between them. Um, then, so that's Livingston, which, 
actually, just before I leave Livingston, the fact that the claimants have conceded now that it was a reasonable view for Mr. Thornhill to take that uh, this that these, these LLPs were conducting themselves with a view to profit makes it very difficult for them to say that the, the nature of the profit meant that it was not being carried on in the way that other people did it. So essentially what they're saying is reduced to the proposition that he should have taken the view they weren't looking for enough profit. And that is a very difficult line to take, so I'll, I'll come on to in a moment on speculation. The third point that's taken is about the badges of trade. I, I don't really want to waste time on this because the, the short point here is that the badges of trade are sometimes useful, they are sometimes not useful. It's a matter of judgment as to whether you think this is a case in which I ought to rattle through the badges or this is a case where I don't have to, it's not appropriate, they don't fit. Uh, the, the claimants said in their skeleton argument that I think they realize that it's wrong, uh, because it is wrong, that the, the use of the badges was mandated by Ensign. Now, that, that is simply wrong. You, you can see that it's wrong uh, because the House of Lords literally don't refer to, to the badges of trade at all, not, not mentioned once. There's one mention by Mr. Justice Miller to see them was at first instance, where he said, must possess the outward badges of trade. Claimant cited that and said, look, that means you have to do the Marston and Morston badges. But actually, uh, he is referring to a decision which he cites there, uh, Mr. Justice Millett, uh, at, I'm, I'm not going to take you to it, but it's at page 123D <coughs> of the report, Authorities 1, 11, 270, where he's actually referring to the case um, called Overseas. And when you look at that, we've added it to the bundle. You find that, he, that, that, that it's a reference to something completely different. Is not referring to the list in Marston and Morston. And therefore, Mr. Justice Millett, to whom Marston and Morston wasn't even cited, was not referring to the badges. So the badges just really don't have anything to do with this case. Mm. The fourth point is lack of speculation. Mm. Now, my first proposition here is that speculation is not mandatory in trade. You don't have to speculate. So hedging is a really clear example of that. If you're sufficiently sophisticated, you can hedge your risk in all sorts of ways. Um, oil traders do this all the time. Many shippers do it. Uh, people are exposed to currency. There are lots of ways in which you can hedge your risk and think to yourself, well, I'm, I, I'm not actually really interested in this being speculative. You don't, by, by speculation, I mean risking loss. You don't have to risk loss to trade. So you know, take, take a simple example of a cheap supply of high quality goods which you can with certainty immediately resell at a profit. Uh, you're not risking loss but you're still trading. But, but, but secondly, even if speculation is mandatory and, and speculation is not mandatory, there was speculation here. So let me unpack that a little bit. The the proposition that there had to be speculation is built by my learned friend on the dictum uh, in Lord Templeman's judgment in Ensign uh, that says that the activities of the Victory Partnership were not a sham and there could have been a profit or a loss. They, they tried to elevate that into a rule of law. That there must be the possibility for profit or loss. And if there's no possibility for profit or, or loss, therefore there's no speculation. That's, that's the proposition. Now, if we take the judgment of 283, please. Which is on page 230. You, you see what the judges find after this exhaustive exercise of going through the very complicated water clause. He, he says, any reasonably competent QC would have concluded one, by reason of the minimum guaranteed amount that the LLP was protected from anything other than a small loss or protected from a loss at all if it was not exercised. So is there the possibility for a loss? Yes, there is. There's a possibility for a small loss if the call option is exercised. 
And then secondly, he says the potential upside in the event the films perform well is significantly curtailed. So is there a possibility for a profit? Yes, there is. In terms, this transaction could have resulted in a profit. It could have resulted in a loss. So even if that is a mandatory proposition, which it is not, on the judge's findings, it was satisfied. So what the claimant's complaint boils down to is the point I was adverting to under Livingston, which is scale. They're not making enough profit or enough loss, but they pointed to no authority from 2003 or, or indeed now, which says that there's a minimum requirement for profit or loss. But what do the claimants say it was? How much money do you have to stand to lose or gain? in order to be considered by them, to be sufficiently speculative, to be trading. And, and the point here really is a simple one, which is that trade is a broad church. You've got room for the cautious, you've got room for the bold. You don't have to be taking big risks in order to be trading. You can manage your exposure. And there's no real basis for suggesting that any reasonable barrister would have taken the view to the contrary, that the degree of profit or loss involved in these arrangements indicated no trade. And, and that's particularly so in relation to the profit. So the judge held, can we go to 262 of the judgment, some four. <coughs> it's page 127. Two six two. Uh, two six two, page one hundred and twenty-seven. The judge's conclusions on the waterfall. Mm. And what he says is that the theoretical maximum profit was, and this is excluding the one percent of receipts above seven hundred and seventy million using rounded numbers, uh, three four hundred sixty-eight million plus six and a half minus uh, three hundred thirteen, which is what they put in to begin with, one hundred and sixty-one million. So that's not to be sneezed at. Uh, the 1% of a blockbuster is what my learned friend calls the, the lottery ticket, and, which is slightly unfair, but I do accept that it's, you know, you, you, you've got to be jolly lucky to get a blockbuster. But the judge is excluding that. He's saying, look, the, the maximum theoretical profit you could have got under these contractual arrangements, which he's carefully analysed, is 161 million, having put in 313. And that's not bad. But the real point here, is that the judge held it's not Mr Thornhill's job to assess the likelihood of that profit. And you, you see that over the page at 269 to begin with, where it says he was instructed to pay the prospects of better profits, depending on success. And then he goes on uh, to say it was reasonable at 277. He says it was reasonable for him to, instruct, uh, to accept those instructions. That was heavily challenged at the trial but it was held that it was reasonable at 277. And then uh, he uh, no, sorry, the, 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 so, the, just putting those two points together, that there was a possibility of further profit, and it wasn't his job to decide how likely it was. He could just say, right, I've been instructed, there's a profit, possibility of further profit, that's fine. He doesn't know how likely it is that it will or will not, will not make the maximum return or something in between. It's not his job, and he doesn't know. So since he doesn't owe a duty to assess how much profit they might make, it's very hard to say that he was negligent not to realise there wasn't enough profit to make the speculation. He, he, he just didn't know one way or the other. And here, Eclipse is quite useful. Eclipses at authorities for tab 29. Because Eclipse shows, if you've got, got it just on the head note, you can see that it was a central issue down, down at letter H. Uh, the FTT held there had been an insufficient level of speculation in the arrangements. So uh, the FTT had been wrong to regard them. Sorry. That, that, that's, that's 
the, the key point is that they, there's an issue in the case about whether there was sufficient level of speculation. And the Court of Appeal held they were entitled to hold as they did. But they say the carrying on of the, of the trade did not necessarily entail an element of risk and speculation. But the FTT had only taken that account into consideration as one of several issues. So they said that they were, the FTT was wrong to say in Eclipse, well after Mr Thornhill, not enough speculation. But they said it didn't matter because it's only one, one factor. Now, now that's quite important because first of all it shows that speculation is not a mandatory aspect of trading. Mm -hmm. But it also shows that the, the, the claimant's criticism of the judge's reasoning are not well founded because even if there'd be no risk at all, it's just one factor. In other words, it's not a showstopper, it's just something to be considered, which is how the judge approached it. And that brings us back to the question of uh, the approach on appeal is something that the judge has weighed very carefully with a lot of materials not before you about the degree of risk. So that is want of speculation. It's not mandatory. There was speculation. Eclipse shows that it's only one factor anyway, and therefore not suitable for review on appeal. Yeah. The, the fifth factor relied on by my learned friend is, is the judge's inappropriate reference to the chronology of the plain vanilla, which I've accepted and I've dealt with. The sixth factor is, is where, where he says, if it's equivocal, you have to take into account motive. I've dealt with that. Uh, motive not relevant per ensign. So if you follow the ensign approach, is where it's, it's just not relevant. And the seventh point is manuals, which I which I've dealt with already as well. Sorry, the se the seventh point is manuals. Manuals, yes. Mm. Should look at the manuals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we've done duty to warn, uh, in, because that that's been raised in the debate already, and I'm not not going to repeat my submissions on that. But essentially, my stand is first the judge is right to say that even if there was a duty owed to these investors, that despite the documents, despite all the circumstances, he was right to say it didn't extend in its scope to giving any further warning at all, because they'd had some decent risk warnings in the IM, they'd been told to take their own advice, and at that point, you know, there's no duty for him to say anything different. They all know that he's advising the seller, uh, and it's up to them if they want further explanation of risk warning. But then he says, if I was wrong about that, it's the relevant risk warning, which has those three features which I identify, which in my submission really don't make much difference to the opinion. So Mr. Thornhill could perfectly properly still have said, I have no doubt, but this is based on previous challenges, revenue, I haven't done it before, but you, know, you never know, they, they could have a go. If they have a go, somebody could take a different view from me. And that really doesn't change his ability to express himself clearly and confidently, which is what the judge said. But my, the, the final point is causation, which I've, I've trailed my code already to some extent. The, the, the first point here is that even if you were to take the view, A, that there was a duty, and B, that it was breached by the use of the uh, strong language to say, I have no doubt, and here I see no problem. That isn't enough for the claimants because they need something much better than a watered down version of no doubt and I see no problem. And, and this arises from the way in which they had to put their causation case. And if we look at the particulars of claim, please, Core 2, tab 14. It says the scheme wouldn't have gone ahead anyway, point. No, no, that's a different, that's a different point. What's this? On the scheme wouldn't have gone ahead anyway. Can I make it clear? I'm not setting up that, that as a barrier to, um, as a causation defence, as it were. In other words, I'm not running my own negligence assume as a barrier to causation, because that would involve saying, ha, if I, if Mr. Thornhill had advised more strongly and they had stopped, that follows you'd never have invested, you'd never have lost the money, and so tough luck. That, that's not the, the, the proposition I've ever run. What I'm on here is uh, the different point 
about how causation has to be assessed. And that is on their case at paragraph 5.3, page 212. So they say, if Mr Thorne had acted competently, he would have declined to endorse the schemes, he would have advised the asserted tax benefits would or may not have been achieved, and or that there was a significant risk that the schemes would be likely to be successfully challenged by HMRC. So significant risk of successful challenge. And that is then carried through that formula into all the individual particulars of claim. Now, if you just flick on to 257, the, 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 once the sample, there was a generic particular claim, and then once the sample had been selected, they all pleaded their own individual stories. Yeah. But they all adopted the same formula, 257, paragraph 5 at the bottom. This is Mr. Brickman, he's the first one. Would not have invested had he advised, or the IM had recorded, that there was a significant risk that the scheme would be successfully challenged. Now, First of all, there is a very large gap in terms of competent advice between I have no doubt and I have to tell you that there's a significant risk of a successful challenge. And where in that spectrum the right warning lies is a matter of how you assess breach. But the judge held, and I, as I've said, endorse his analysis, that the relevant risk warning is actually much weaker and more watery than this case. They've come nowhere near establishing that any reasonable barrister would have given this weapons-grade warning significant risk of successful challenge. Now, I never challenged the evidence of the sample claimants when they said that a risk warning of that nature would have stopped them investing, because it seems to me to be fairly obviously unchallengeable. If you're a, 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 an investor trying to avoid tax, you're in the market, you're sitting with your IFA, you're looking for a scheme, he's got six schemes on his desk, says, which one do you fancy, Mrs. Smith? And she says, and that one says significant risk of successful challenge. I, I, th I think I'll look at another one. Nobody's going to put their money in if that's the risk warning that they should have been given. But if the risk warning is as per the judge, or anything which is less than a weapons grade significant risk of successful challenge, they all fail, because that's the only causation case run. And anything less than that just won't do for them. And I would respectfully suggest that there is no realistic prospect. You would have to take such a different view from the judge on so many points to hold that it got to significant risk of successful challenge. That this just isn't realistic. And here it's really important to remember the process by which the judge proceeds, because he doesn't simply say, right, it's end sign, stop, that's it. He then goes on to consider, in considerable detail, what uh, Mr Thornhill or any reasonable barrister would have found if they had looked fully at the facts, and, as, as, as is said. Now, I just need to unpack that, and I'm, I'm nearly at the end. So if we turn to 132, page 132, and the detailed criticisms held made by the claimants. 132 what, sorry? I'm so sorry, 132 um, page of the judgment, yep. paragraphs from 286 onwards. Detailed criticisms made by the claimants. And at 287, they say the first thing he failed to consider in analysing all the, he failed to consider all the facts and circumstances. So that's the, should have, should have done it from the ground up. Uh, and he says, well, it's a wrong approach. But then he says, and this is really important at 289, he says, look, in this case, if you are going to do ground up, if you are going to consider all the facts, then what all you could do was read the key contractual documents, because those are facts, which is similar to the position in Ensign. That's Lord Templeman's reference to 
There are only 17 documents. And the, he, he rejected the attack that was made on Mr. Thornhill, that he basically hadn't read them properly. Uh, although the claims contend Mr. Thornhill admitted he hadn't read them line by line, I am satisfied from his evidence overall that he did understand the importance of the track of documents, and that by a combination of being taken through the documents in meetings and reading them on his own, he did review them carefully and take them into consideration at the time. Now that tells you that he did consider all the facts, and as the judge goes on to say, anyway, whether he did or didn't, if you had properly reviewed the documents, if you had looked at all the facts, could you have reached the same conclusion? And, and that's then the rest of the analysis here, which is on the hypothesis of a reasonable silk who has, has done all the facts. In other words, they haven't gone top down ensign. What he's looking at in all this section is well, what it would have been like if you'd gone ground up yeah. looking at all the facts. And he reaches his con conclusions, which we've seen, that it was reasonable. So even if the claimants are satisfied, which they shouldn't, that the ensign approach was negligent to follow. And even if they satisfy you that he shouldn't therefore have said, no doubt, uh, here I see no problem, then the judge has said, well, somebody doing it the other way around would still have concluded that this was a reasonable view. And that has a, a, a very substantial effect on the relevant risk warning, because they're still entitled to say, yeah, this works. And that is miles away from significant risk of successful challenge. So the judge has actually held it doesn't make any difference. Because even if it wasn't ensign and it was ground up, you still reach the reasonable view that, it, that the scheme flies. And you do not have to say significant risk of successful challenge. So although I know I'm a very long way down the analysis, as this is kind of my final ditch, I commend that ditch to you because there is no way that you can overturn sufficient findings of the judge on the way that this scheme worked and the reasonable view that could have been taken on it to get the claimants to where they need to get as their final destination, which is a warning of significant risk of successful challenge. And unless I can help you with anything further, those are my submissions. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful. We'll uh, take a break in five minutes. <coughs>
Sorry? Ten minutes. More than ten minutes. I don't think so. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? There's a decision for this. Yes, Mr. Stewart. Lord, I know this. Happily, 
the scope of the debate is somewhat narrowed, and I'm going to focus on what uh, I submit are the key differences which sure. your, this court has to decide. Mm -hmm. So far as duty is concerned, there are three matters where uh, I submit that the court might, as a result of my learned friend's attractive submissions, fall into grievous error. The first is in relation to the starting point for the assessment and categorization of this case. His starting point is that this is a lawyer, sometimes he says lawyers, sometimes he says barristers, negligence case, which is true in the sense that it's a case against a barrister. But it is not in our submission, properly to be so categorised. It is a case concerning the supply of information for investment. And the principles which govern it would govern in particular other professionals, such as accountants, surveyors, different forms of valuers and so forth, all of whom provide professional advice for putting into information memoranda. And just linking to that was a point in the argument when Lady Justice Simler said that it was bog standard for barristers at the tax bar to um, act in relation to matters such as this. If it's being said that it's bog standard to advise in relation to schemes such as this, there is plainly no question and doubt in that. If it's being said that it's bog standard to provide information for investors in investment memoranda, I venture to suggest that that is not the case. And that is the distinction which we say is important. Mm -hmm. The second, and, and just to f the starting point, and I'll come on to this in a minute, is important when one comes to my learned friend's propositions. Although, as with so many of these things, one um, gets to a lessening point of distinction. The second and linked point to that is in my submission, the erroneous proposition that because the long form opinions were addressed to Scots, at the point at which Mr. Thornhill agreed that those opinions could be made available to investors and approved the investment memorandum in its terms, in my submission that becomes irrelevant. And can I just give you an illustration in relation to that? Of course it is the case that if as a barrister you are addressing an opinion to a particular client. You take account of the knowledge and sophistication of that client. And when you are advising a personal client, you may well put it in different terms from when you're acting on behalf of Ernst & Young or whatever. But, and here's a big but, if you get told and asked to confirm that your opinion can be provided to someone else, knowing that they are going either to be likely to rely on it, or that they're going to be induced to seek to buy something on the result of it, then if you choose not to put in a disclaimer and to allow it to go forward, then you are assuming responsibility under the law to those who read it. And that gets rid, in my submission, of a lot of the dead wood in relation to this case. The third and almost the most critical point, in fact, not almost the most critical point, the most critical point in relation to duty is the proper approach to the construction of the information memorandum. And then linked to that, the proper approach to the subscription documents. 
And I will, if I may, address those three points. I've said pretty well all I want to say about the second point, but I'm going to just elaborate a little bit further on the first and the third uh, points. And just to be clear about this, the way that this fits in <coughs> is that my learned friend's very helpful summary of his five points in relation to duty, which was yesterday afternoon, yeah. day two, page 122. They start off with the general proposition that the lawyer owes no duty. Then they go through the new G exceptions in Ashraf, uh, and then they get to the point where they say that the crucial test is paragraph 19 of uh, NRAM. Yeah. Now, I, I don't dispute, and I didn't dispute when I opened it, and I'm certainly not going to dispute it in reply, that the essence of the test is paragraph 19 of NRAM. So the first point only takes you so far, but it is very important as to where you're starting from. Because in my submission, if one looks at the law in relation to uh, prospectus cases and advice being supplied, you start off from a very different starting point, so far as assumptions are concerned, as to reliance. And just making the general point, there isn't a special statute for the protection of barristers who choose to provide information to investors. What applies to um, Barristers who choose to give information to investors does apply to Ernst & Young. It does apply to Clifford Chance. It does apply to Healy & Baker, Drivers Jonas, and so on and so forth. And uh, in my submission, the points my learned friends did not answer in that respect were, first of all, the point whereby Lord Justice Denning's um, dissenting judgment is approved in Caparo. But then secondly, when the cases were looked at, all the cases which were being looked at were one of two sorts. None of them, I was going to use plain vanilla, but that has now had too many um, uses in this, were straightforward cases where people had provided information which they knew was going to make its way into an information memorandum for which they accepted responsibility. Now, I did something very dangerous in this context, uh, which is that I have supplied, I hope, to the court and to my learned friend uh, some extracts from a book called Jackson and Powell on Professional Negligence. I normally try and avoid doing that. And my excuse for normally doing so was that it's not a work of authority. Sadly, in respect of one of the editors, it depends upon whether it was in an earlier edition of the book. Yes. Just well, it, it's, um, it, it, it does, my lord. To an extent, anyway. To an extent, anyway. The, the to avoid you the embarrassment of saying, well, I wrote that bit. <laughs> well, what, what I'm going to show you... You've got <laughs> Sorry, <three. laughs> Stuart, I, I, I was a bit surprised you hadn't referred to Jackson and Powell, actually. <laughs> Well, I have the misfortune now to be the longest serving general editor of Jackson and Powell on the special liability, and it has far too much into it, which on occasions causes embarrassment to encourage any citation. Time flies by, Mr. Stewart. Well, what you have, I'm afraid, starting is uh, a section from the third edition. Can I just Jack ask, have you, have, has this been supplied? Uh, I mean, uh, we were told we were going to get hard copies. We were told we'd get hard copies. We know we got electronic copies. But none of us have brought the electronic copies. Uh, it, it was provided as, as I came into court this morning. I haven't read it. I don't know what's in it. Well, um, we'll have to see how we get it. You've had it, but what about us? I gave it to ah. the car. <laughs> your, your, I'm not facing sorry. an important question. Sorry. My, my learning junior says that it was given to your clerks and it should be on your desk in hard copy. Oh, no, it isn't. Oh dear. They were given hard copy. Sorry about this. Sorry, just in relation to the point my learning friends made. What the email that we got said is that we would be receiving hard copies in court. Uh, I'd rather assume that we're going to get them this afternoon. We're scurrying around. Can I just, while, whilst, while that is being done, just make yeah. the obvious point. My learning friend is absolutely right. Yeah. 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 
I have put an electronic copy, so that's fine. Hmm. The third edition. <laughs> don't, don't worry about. Don't worry about Charlie. Just. Well, it's one of those vanishing mysteries, and I'm sorry, Mum. Yeah, don't worry. These things happen. This used to happen far more often uh, 10 or 20 years ago. Um, can, can I just make the obvious point? My learned friend's absolutely right. He hasn't had these other than very shortly before this one. He's plenty yeah. of the right of reply. I will finish, seeing my learned friend finished, um, yeah. within his time by 4.15. So the time well, which yeah. is available, that's fine. As I said, we'll go on to call the five if we have to. Which, ex which chapter are we going to look at? So we've, 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 you've got um, two... Yeah. Things. The first is a part of the third edition in 1992, and it's yeah. paragraph 853. Okay. Well, I think it's better if your junior just approaches the bench and give, rather than trying to explain to the clerk, just to, just to come to the bench and give us what. Well, you got, we got it. There seems to be a lot of explaining going on. Before you Thank you. That's the tax bill for you. So we've got the third and the ninth. So you've got the, the third and the ninth. The third is 1992. For what it's worth, I was an editor, but not the general editor. And there, this chapter, as the preface shows, was written by Mr. John Powell. Should we give that to, to the right. Okay, who is happily still alive, so it's not a welcome yeah. authority, but um, it's, okay. it's dealing... Right. This is the third edition. Third edition, 1992. It's the first edition post uh, Capara. Yeah. And it deals with the situation under D of liability arising. This is in the chapter dealing with accountants. Arising for reports and listing particulars and company prospectuses. Accountants may incur liability in the tort of negligence to third parties arising out of inaccurate statements in offer documents for securities, e.g. a prospectus or listing particulars in respect of securities listed on the International Stock Exchange, uh, etc. Thus, in Anders and Merton, Lord Salmon instanced the case of well-known firm of accountants certifying in prospectus the annual profits of the issuing company, which owing to their negligence were seriously overstated. He considered that persons who invested in the company reliant on the accuracy of the certificate have a claim for da damages against the accountants for money lost as a result of their negligence. However, consistent with the criteria for a duty of care expressed in Caparo, they owe a duty of care only in respect of statements in an offer document for which they have accepted responsibility and then only to such persons whom they know or ought to know will rely on and do rely on such statements. Moreover, the requisite proximity is likely only to be established between the accountants and the person to whom the offer doc document is specifically directed, e.g. shareholders and a rights issue, and for its specific purpose, e.g. subscription for shares or purchase of shares and the sale of an offer document issued for the purpose of an offer sales. Unlikely to be established between the accountants and persons who purchase securities in the market, albeit a reliance on the offer document. Yep. And then 8.54 goes on to deal with the statutory regime. Yep. So that was the law which Jackson and Powell said was the position in 1992. Yes. You then had the um, 19th, 9th edition. Uh, this um, is published in September 2021. And you've got it starting at paragraph 17075. And this is again from the current Duke section dealing with accountants. The categories of claimants who most frequently claim to be owed duties of care by accountants are as follows. One existing shareholders, two potential investors. It's the potential investors that I want to look at. Um, after dealing with uh, that over the page at 17078, Potential investors, Caparo established there is generally no duty of care to investors. However, there is usually little difficulty in establishing the duty of care is owed to recipients of takeover circulars or promotional documents by an accountant who has consented to the inclusion of information provided by him. The footnote is then a reference to the statutory liability. Such documents are known to be directed to particular recipients or classes of recipients who may rely on them for investment purposes. And then 223 is in fact a reference to a strikeout uh, case, but the important point in relation to the strikeout case was that it wasn't directly on point in relation to relying on information in particulars, it was trying to get an expansion of that, uh, and you see that from what is said in the footnote. And the accountants <coughs> may know that such reliance may extend beyond the initial production, so the later investment or investments may fall within the scope of his duty. And then you get the um, 
reference 224 to the decision of Mr. Justice Lightman in Pulse Fund Custodian Trustees. If you are interested, which I suspect you may well not be, that case has traces the statutory provisions in even more detail in relation to the statutory liability than mine does from 1890s through until now. And then, um, uh, not sufficient shows foreseeable in a general sort of way that the accounts might be relied on the course of takeover. Claimant must show that the auditor knew or ought to have known that his report be relied on for a particular person or class of persons for a specific purpose. And then 225 is Scott Group and McFarlane, a yeah. well-known decision of the uh, Court of Appeal of New Zealand, which refused liability on particular facts. It wasn't, it, it was an example of a case which made it plain that you had to know who it was that you were going to be advising and so forth, it was set out in the President's dictum. And then in addition to liability for information and takeover circulars and offer documents, an accountant might also achieve care in tort in respect to statements made in negotiations on behalf of his client. Whether such a duty arises depends very much on the particular circumstances and the proper analysis, etc. And then there is a long footnote at 226, which goes over the page, and that deals with the cases which are dealing on statements made in the course of negotiations. Now, the upshot of all of that is that um, there is not, to my knowledge, a case which directly asserts that an accountant or indeed another professional who um, authorizes statements to be made in the prospectus knows that it's going to be issued to a particular class of people is liable in the tort of negligence. But in my submission, all of the cases are around extensions and adoptions of that, not the other way around. There are certainly no cases which go the other way in the absence, in the absence of express disclaimers of the sort you see in Brown and Innovator number one. And in my submission, that therefore shows and points you towards two things. One is that the statutory regime which I opened upon, which goes back to its histories to the 1890s, does form the backdrop for the principles in relation to this. When people issue documents to the public, they take care either to accept responsibility for them or to make it plain they're not doing it. If they accept responsibility for them, then in my submission, as night follows day, they accept a duty of care to the investors to whom they're providing them. Now that, of course, I immediately accept, begs the question as to what the proper approach to the information memorandum is. But to suggest that NRAM, in the very different circumstances of this case, has somehow altered the law or made things different or looked at matters in a different way is in my submission a very bold submission and if correct would have enormous implications across the whole of the field of uh, the provision of um, details for public participation. Mm. I say public and then friends got the point, this isn't public because of the statutory regime, but for to issuing documents for mass circulation. And can, can I just make a, a few observations about the reasoning behind this? This, this actually goes back to, to the to 19th century and, and was what led in some ways to the outrage in Parliament, which led to the Director's Liability Act and so forth. When you're packaging up information to sell investments. You're selling, of course, but you're packaging up and selling to a large number of individuals. You, in this case, Scots, are looking to make a very large profit. The loan friends already identified. They took 11 million pounds off the top of this, out of which they paid commission, he told you, of two and a half, three million, or whatever it is. So there's 11 million going off the top, out of these investors' pockets, into people. Now, it may be, of course, as in this case, that the minimum investment is £100,000. But nonetheless, 
they are being sold in the context of a package of information which, in the absence of my submission of disclaimers, they will uh, expect to rely on and will rely on. And it is for that reason that saying that NRAM has some special test or that there's some lawyer's defense act or some principle by where this court should approach differently the liability of barristers or solicitors from others is quite wrong. The next point to make, just before we get there, is that um, I ask you to focus, when we look at the prospectus, which is what we're going to do now, on the position of Ernst & Young. Uh, my lady, Lady Justice Carr, asked whether the, we have the documents we had, there were before the court below, the documents relating to Ernst and Young. And the answer is that we have at least some of those, and uh, I will uh, show you them to you. Were they before Maybe. the judge? Well, they were in the trial, by the way. But were they shown to the judge? I, 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 I told no, and I'm, I'm, they were in the trial, by the way. But I, I actually, in a sense, don't need to. Um, I don't. I don't need to, I, mean, I, I, I was going to show them to you, but the position, relevance. well, their relevance is that when we get to the critical paragraphs, Ernst and Young are mentioned in the same paragraph, and so the principle so far of duty would have to, we say, apply in the same way to Ernst and Young as to Mr Thornhill. Can I, can I go to the memorandum first? That's why I was interested in it. Well, can, I, can I go to the memorandum first and make... Uh, my submissions in relation to the uh, memorandum because they are, in our submission, at the absolute heart of this case. Yeah. Now, my learned friend is um, skillful in many, many respects, but one thing that he was particularly skillful about was that yesterday he interjected just before he got to the fourth paragraph on page 360. And today, he made all of his submissions by reference to uh, what the information memorandum meant and so forth, before he then went back to the fourth paragraph on page 360. Can I just make the following observations? On the cover piece of this, 358, it is referred to as an information memorandum. It is a memorandum which provides information to these investors. That in <coughs> information consists both of facts and of uh, statements of opinion and mixed statements of fact and statement of opinion and inferential matters which are drawn from the contents. All of it is within the four body or the four corners of the information memorandum. Secondly, I completely accept that step two, paragraphs two and three make it plain that you are outside the statutory scheme. Uh, I don't want to quibble as to whether or not these are ultra high earth worth investors and so forth. If one was looking at it, um, one might do so. But you are outside the statutory scheme, that is true. But after you've had the paragraphs which deal with doubt, one, outside the statutory scheme two, and then um, a warning in relation to length of term and illiquidity, four in my submission is critical. And within four, it has the following express statements. The first statement is in the first sentence. The sponsor is responsible for the information contained in this document. In my submission, Information in this context means all statements in this document. It's not facts. It can't possibly be facts for two reasons. One is there's a contra contradiction to facts in a minute. And secondly, this document is called an information memorandum. Then, to the best of the knowledge and belief of the sponsor, so that is effectively a statement as to honesty and for these purposes, just take out the brackets, which has taken all the information contained in this document is in accordance with the facts. So that's 
the next statement, two. Third, putting brack in brackets, it is stated, uh, which has taken reasonable care to ensure that such is the case. So that's saying that in reaching this, we have taken reasonable skill and care. And then fourth, and perhaps most important of all, and does not omit anything likely to affect the import of such information. Now, that is very, very close to a fair representation of the risk statement. It is saying, here's the information. We're responsible for it. We believe it to be true. We've taken all reasonable skill and care to ensure that it's case. And in addition, it doesn't omit anything likely to affect the import of such information. And then this, the sponsor accepts responsibility accordingly. Now the question which my learned friend did never grapple with, and in my submission, the failure to grapple with it is the dog that didn't bark in the night, is if this is at face value to be taken, as I have said, it is to be taken. How on earth can you read the warranties in particular that he relies on in the um, subscription documents and the statements as being anything other than referring to matters outside the information memorandum? On the first page of this document, you've got a multifaceted acceptance of responsibility. Now, in addition, when you then go, um, there, there are, we all know important parts of this, but when you then go to um, page 372, in, when you go to 372, the tax analysis set out herein is based on the sponsor's understanding of current UK tax legislation and published practice, and on UK generally accepted accounting practice. That is, first of all, a statement of fact. It's a statement, secondly, of the fact that they have taken all reasonable care and skill to ensure that that is the case. And third, it is a statement that they do not know anything which might affect the import of that. When they then say members are advised to consult their tax advisor refer to the risk factors on 19 and 20, my learned friend says, oh, that means you can't rely on it at all. That, with respect, when you look at the fourth paragraph, is simply nonsense. It's not saying that at all. If it had said that, you would have to say, despite what we said, we're not taking any responsibility for tax which would be a bit like saying, she's a great little bus, I'd stake my life on her, but she doesn't actually move. Because it's the tax which is at the heart of this investment. And then, the next bit, whilst no advance ruling on tax procedures available in UK transactions for cases such as this, advice has been received from Mr. Andrew Thornhill, a senior UK tax counsel and head of public court tax chambers. And my learned friend said, I banged on about this. That's because it's been banged on about to the investors. This is at the key part of it, of selling this document to them. And then one gets a question of construction, because on any view, um, this isn't well drafted. In respect of tax, and from Ernst and Young, um, LLP in respect of accounting policies and the financial summary's consistency with those policies and with the tax advice received from Mr Thornhill. And the question of construction, my learned friend says, that only means advice from Mr Andrew Thornhill in respect of tax, whereas in my submission, although it is somewhat concluded, it means in respect of tax and the financial summary's consistency with those policies. No. I mean, it's very badly worded. But so the advice from Ernst and Young is in respect of accounting policies and in respect of the financial summary, in the sense of the consistency of the financial summary with the accounting policies and the tax advice. 
we look so at what it's dealing I, with two it's dealing with two things and it's it's badly worded but um well, well Lord, i might ask in that case to show you what Ernst well I, I i'm not prepared to look at something that wasn't actually shown to the judge well, or well, well, relied on before the judge in the absence of an application for well, can, I, can i just tell you made, Mr. Sorry, Stewart. sorry can i just tell you my lord i i the, the ernst and young documents 69 and 83 where i'm told in uh, our opening paragraph 64 foot 97 um, that sorry they were where they were in our opening before the judge they're anyway referred to, are they? sorry they're referred to in your opening they're referred to in, in skeleton the, argument or what in the opening skeleton argument before the judge if they were referred to in the opening skeleton then they're taken to have been read by the judge that's fine um, now my lord can i can i though um just just stand back and look and see what this is doing. I mean, copies of the opinion and advice from Ernst and Young are available from the sponsor. Given in particular what we say, he, um, sorry, given in particular the statement of responsibility in the form, Scots could not possibly, in the exercise of reasonable skill and care, put forward what is said as they do about the tax consequences and so on and so forth, unless the opinions of counsel uh, from Mr. Uh, Andrew Thornhill were in accordance with that. Secondly, and very materially to the um, debate which was taking place before you, if those opinions had contained any material qualification that would have to have been specifically reflected in the documents. Self-evidently also, the fact that Mr Thornhill, as you know, referred, um, sorry, um, approved the material parts of the information memorandum and that his opinion would be made available. In my submission, one is looking at a case where the investors are being told in two different ways, those admittedly who ask the opinion directly, no doubt, no problem, but actually they're being told materially the same because otherwise the doubts and so forth would have to have been uh, reflected in the IM. And the consequences of what my learned friends, my learned friends' argument says that Scots were saying nothing about tax whatsoever. That's what they, that's what he said. That the statement as to acceptance only means he reads it. The sponsor is res responsible for the information to the best of his knowledge, which is taken away to ensure the information contained in this document, the facts are in accordance with the facts. Well, in my submission, that's an impossible. Uh, construction. But as soon as one says that the statements are all in accordance, and you then go to the uh, warranties, which are in supplementary uh, bundle uh, two, Scots say is that they consider that the partnership will make a taxable loss. Or they consider, yeah, they say under expected tax outcome on 366. Yes. So what, I think what was said was Scots never at any stage say this scheme will work or there will be the tax benefits, but, but they do consider. They, my lady, absolutely, absolutely. Right. But that, but now let's imagine a position. Well, first of all, let's take the extreme case. Let's let's take fraud and, and look at the terms of the subscription um, documents uh, at um, sorry, I just lost it. Uh, the terms of the subscription documents at um, yeah, supplemental bundle one. Thank you. Tab one. Thank you. Yes. And I'll take them in the same order as my learned friend took them. He relies particularly on warrants to the operator that he or she has relied only 
or on the advice of, or has only consulted with his own professional advisors. And so he's saying, well, Scots don't give any advice at all. On that construction, therefore, what this warranty means is that, in fact, they've got an opinion from Mr Thornhill, which is referred to, and it says diametrically opposite to what the statements say, and they know it, There's a, that's a no-reliance clause. Now, it may well be that, obviously, that will get struck down in relation to a fraudulent misrepresentation under UPTA, but that's what he says as a matter of construction. The same is true in relation to a position where that happened negligently. Suppose that Mr Thornhill had given his opinion, he'd phoned up the Secretary at Scots, and somehow or other it had got lost and not gone through. So plainly, this, on his construction, is far, far too wide on any sensible construction of the information memorandum and these documents taken together. You say because it makes a nonsense of paragraph four of the notice page. Uh, if, if, he const if it's construed as he says it is, you can't. Well, uh, that's on your construction of the notice page. It's on my construction. Uh, paragraph four of the notice page. Yes. But he doesn't make a nonsense if Mr. If Mr. Adam is right as to the construction. Well, if, if you mean on the on the construction that this actually... I mean, it, it, it might be said the other way around. I'm, 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 I mean, goodness me knows what the right answer is. We're going to have to go and think about it. But it might be said the other way around, that your construction of the information memorandum makes a complete nonsense of these warranties. Well, but... Because, well, they, because they don't... I mean, I know, you, I, I know what you told us they meant um, in opening, but on the face of it, um, they appear to say some fairly make some fairly clear well, uh, points about well, having only relied on the advice of their own advisors. But, but that, on, that, on that basis, that is saying I haven't relied on the vast majority of the information memorandum, even though on the front page of the information memorandum you've got the express acceptance of responsibility. I mean, if that's going to be the approach to commercial documents uh, in... Uh, London in relation to information memoranda, it is going to have a very dramatic effect indeed in relation to uh, how these matters are looked at. And on the disjunctive point, if I may say so, it's plainly right that it is disjunctive, has only relied on the advice or has only consulted with his own professional advisors. Well, as soon as you get as one possibility, the warranty is only consulted with his own professional advisors. That says, well, he's only consulted with his professional advisors, but he's still entitled to rely on the information memorandum. And if that's the right construction, then it doesn't negative reliance on the information memorandum. It's also, in my submission, the complete answer to the point about the IFAs. The fundamental job of the IFAs is to seek to ensure that um, the investor understands what it is that he's signing up to. I can no doubt argue about other things. But plainly, there is a complete difference between an information memorandum which on its present, on its proper construction, says as I says it does, you can rely on the information you're provided in the information memorandum and which you're told you can have, and the one which he says, which effectively is the equivalent of saying you can't rely on anything material in the information memorandum. Well, with regard, it says only relied on the advice of or consulted with tax, legal, currency, and other economic considerations. Um, now, five, I'm not going to repeat my point. You've got the point about appropriate professional advice, um, which is begging the question. And it, bluntly, if my learned friend doesn't get home on 4G, he certainly doesn't get home on 4 on the subscription agreement, which is haven't provided and do not provide any investment, taxation, or other advice to me generally and specifically in connection with the thing. That's all looking at Scots, the ALMP, and their respective staff. And uh, that's obviously, in my submission, advice or recommendations outside the contents of the information memorandum. Uh, now, I think my learned friend and I do agree, we probably agree on quite a lot, but we, we certainly agree that the construction point 
points, depending on which way you want to look at it, in relation to the information memorandum are extremely important in relation to this. And so for those purposes, you are going to have to look at this. But I do suggest that when you do so, and you look at Innovator, the facts of this case are a million miles from Innovator. In Innovator, you could not have had a more broadly worded or more prominently displayed abdication of any responsibility for anything contained in the relevant documents. So there was a disclaimer and no responsibility clause. There was no responsibility clause in, in Innovator. Absolutely. And there was an, an I, I, there, were, there were both. Disclaimer as well. It was it was it was it was nuts and bolts. And here, on any view, you've got an express acceptance of responsibility on the first page of the memorandum. You haven't got that in Innovator. You haven't got anything in Innovator saying, we accept responsibility for the information in a document called Information Memorandum. Mr. Justice Hamblin wasn't considering that situation or anything appropriate or close to it. Yeah. Um, that's really what I want to say about duty. Mm -hmm. Can I make some um, points about breach? Sorry, just, I'm so sorry, but just yeah, page 360, as you say. We're sorry, sorry to, I didn't hear the page. I'm sorry, it's the, 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 the notice page where yeah. needs to be read as a whole, but if you go back um, to the discussion that I have with Mr. Adler about what, what information in the second line of paragraph four means. Um, if you go down to paragraphs, do you see the phrase statements and proje projections made in this document? Yes. And, so, and so you're statements and oh, yeah, projections yes. made in this document. Um, you say that would fall into the category of information. I do. I, I, I say that information in this involves all statements, whether of fact or opinion. And that is consistent both with the language of the document itself, it's also consistent with the way that the matter has been approached in public prospectuses since the 1890s. And the distinction sought to be drawn between statements of fact and statements of opinion just doesn't exist here. Obviously, what you need to satisfy yourself that you've exercised reasonable skill and care in relation to the same are, are, are different. If you're looking at a fact, you look for evidence of the fact. If you're looking to verify a statement of opinion, it has to be from a properly qualified person. You've got to be given the correct instructions and so on and so forth. But there simply isn't a distinction in, the, in, this, in this field so far as what is information between statements of fact and statements of opinion. Um, I, I have also handed up in the, there's a section from Jackson and Powell, uh, which may help. It's the current edition, and it's um, in relation. It may help in relation to this this question of. Is it relevance of defendants' qualifications? Uh, it's the one about qualifications. Yes. This is this is. Um, I'm terribly sorry. There's, there's some background noise here, and I, I can't hear at the moment terribly, terribly well. It's, it's coming from up there somewhere. Um, we've asked someone to speak. I think we've got it. No, sorry, I just didn't hear what the chart, what you said, my lord. That's all. I, I just said. That, um, I'm just realizing that we have two. Yeah, sorry, you've got two bits of Jackson and Powell. Two bits of Jackson and Powell. And, and what you've got at 2189, and, and I, I, I won't, if I may, read it out. No. But it, it's relevance of defendants' qualifications and experience. <coughs> it's going, actually, to standard of care. It's from a section which was written by the late Mr. Cannon. So Is this a Boland point? It's, it's linked to the Boland point. Yeah, right? that's but it's, 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 it's more directly on the point which might you, you, you said, what happens if you've got, what's the difference between a junior doctor and a consultant, if I can yeah, put it in, yeah. in that, that sort of way. And, well, it's, it's, it's a rather more nuanced passage. Um, and I, I don't 
with your lordship's leave, um, propose to read the whole of it. No, now. okay, that's fine. Uh, but can I just say how it might fit into the into the debate, which is this: mm. plainly, it recognises in my submission that is the case that in different professions there are different levels of expertise. One of the ones where you see this very clearly is in relation to, for example, the art world, where you get specialism, subspecialism, and so forth. But there are lots of professions which have different aspects of it. The mm. point for present purposes is that the prospectus, sorry, the information memorandum, was holding out Mr. Um, uh, Thornhill as being at the top of the tree in relation to it. And in my submission, when that is being used to induce sales, and when it is coupled with the express acceptance of responsibility, you may think that that is a factor in favour of the imposition of a duty of care. I, I don't put it any higher than that, but, but that's how it fits into the debate at this stage. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, can we then just um, step back uh, in relation to this and just look at breach? The first core allegation of negligence is giving emphatic advice. No doubt, no problem. The first point, the first point to make is the one I've already made. If there were significant doubt, that would have to be reflected in the IM. The second is that the judge in my submission simply did not deal head on directly with the question as to whether or not no doubt, no opinion could have been supplied non-negligently to investors who he knew were likely to be induced to enter into a sale by it. Now the finding, as you know, is took comfort from but in my submission, it is impossible on these facts, looked at objectively, to say anything else. He knew this was going to be used to seek to induce a sale. Once you get to that point, the debate which you were having about whether or not Scots knew the history of trading and so forth, in my submission, is irrelevant, point one. Secondly, and in any event, to say that there was no doubt about something which at its heart depended upon drawing an overall conclusion of fact on a matter which is within the fact jurisdiction of the trial tribunal in tax matters, namely trading, from a decision of the House of Lords is impossible. And there isn't some special defence for tax silks in relation to how you construe judgments. There were numerous references throughout the authorities to the need to consider all the facts. We've shown you them. For these purposes, one shouldn't actually get too hung up on badges of trade, the practice, as it were, before Mr Thornhill uh, um, looked at the matter and multifactorial approach, they're both actually emphasising that to consider trading, you've got to look at lots of different things. And the Vice-Chancellor, Sir Nicholas Brown Wilkinson, made it plain in the case which was the origin of badges of trade. But it weren't an exhaustive list, and I read you the passage in April, which said, look, um, as far as I can see, there's only one general rule, which is that um, you can have a trade even if it's only a one-off. But these are helpful pointers and factors. So you have to get a process, and in my submission, this isn't some technical arcane aspect of tax law, to the proposition that you can be completely firm in your view as to a conclusion of fact from an observation which is, in my submission, completely unclear. It doesn't actually even support it, in my submission, in the House of Lords in Ensign. Secondly, you've got the point that Mr Justice Millett himself refers at first instance to the need to consider all the circumstances. Third in my submission, you've got the point that in the very passage relied on by Millett and friends, the 
key part of Lord Templeman's speech, he refers to the need for speculation. That throws in issue the whole question of on a commercial basis. As a matter of law, the judge, the, the fact that Merlin and Friends says, well, look, you relied on some of the same factors in relation to trading as in relation to on a commercial basis, takes Merlin and Friend absolutely nowhere. The, the fact of the matter is that the commercial basis test is harder to pass than the trading test. And so simply saying, well, it's still trading despite these factors, doesn't help. And if there is some mystical ensign test, there is no support at all in ensign for suggesting that you can leap over the commercial basis test by anything in ensign. You've got the reference to the lack of consideration of badges of trade. My learned friends didn't seek to um, dispute the fact that that's what the Inland Revenue was saying. He did seek to rely on sale and leaseback. And he accepts that the judge went wrong in relation to um, the manual that he relied on. And he said, well, look, look at these sale and leaseback schemes, uh, which had tra trading aspects which were uh, not um, in issue. But can we, um, uh, can we just actually look? what the manual which was in force at the relevant time said. We haven't looked at this yet. It's Supplementary Bundle 2, page 420. Tab 63. Sorry, sorry. Tab 63, my lord. 63. Now, this is July 2003, so it's very shortly before uh, the SAD 2 and SAD 3 schemes. And it's advice in relation to um, sale and leasebacks. Sale and finance leaseback transactions are sometimes referred to as tax deferment schemes. First point, tax deferment, not tax avoidance. This is because the relief given at the beginning of the lease period is recovered over the term of the lease as the lease rentals fall due. This is acceptable, provided the terms of the lease reflect the economic use of the asset and the rentals are spread evenly over the terms of the lease. The current industry practice for film sale and lease sale is broadly in line with this treatment and should not be challenged, where A, little one, the term of the lease is up to 15 years, provided the film can reasonably expect to generate income. Little two, there is annual escalation of lease rentals of up to 5%. If it appears that a film is unlikely to generate income for at least the period adopted or rentals are escalated at more than 5% a year, a report should be made to business tax technical. Well, the 5% is definitely not applicable. It's definitely tax avoidance, not tax deferral. And what you've got here is for reasons known only to Gordon Brown and Her Majesty's Revenue, a statement that provided particular schemes are put into effect, they're not going to be challenged. Yeah. That doesn't give you any comfort at all that the revenue is deciding not to apply the general law when it gets schemes which it is bound to hate. But doesn't it give the at least impression that the revenue regard the production and exploitation of films through IP and licensing as it trading? Well, milady, I, I wouldn't submit that it does. I would submit that it's effectively saying by way of what might be no doubt argued to be an extra, extra statutory concession, but provided you fall within these, they're not going to get challenged. So it doesn't say that we're going to disapply everything else we say about trading or anything of that nature. And it's specifically in the contemplation and understanding of the um, sections uh, which your ladyship referred to. Yeah, 40, it's, it's 42 and 48, but, but it proceeds on the assumption that this is trading, doesn't it? There's no extra statutory concession. Well, it's this is acceptable, in other words, it's accepted as trading commercially with a view to profit, unless, and then there are other things that come into the balance. Yes, Milady, against that, you've got all of the points about you need to look carefully at tax avoidance and so forth, which are in the, and you've got what the requirements are for trading and so forth. Your, your 
you're pretty bold if you're relying on this to say no doubt and so forth. Um, can I, uh, with some temerity, and with the temptation to do something I haven't um, yeah. done for a very long period of time, which is to like give the last five minutes to my learned junior, um, uh, do um, ju just make one point about transparency and the point which was made about Mr. Yates's particulars of claim in the um, document which my learned friend showed to you. This and is it, the point about the LLP yes. statement of case. And can I just make a series of propositions uh, which are, um, I hope, uncontroversial? First, for an LLP to be transparent for tax purposes, the test is whether the LLP is conducting a trade or business with a view to profit, section 118ZA of the Income and Corporation Tax. Mm -hmm. If it's not transparent, then it's broadly treated like a company. For a member to get tax relief, it's got to be transparent and the three conditions have got to be met. An LLP has to file a tax return setting out its income, even if transparent. The LLPs, which consider themselves to be transparent, thus file tax returns, which you can see from paragraph two of the statement of claim. A partnership tax return requires the partnership to decide whether it's trading. If it's deciding it is trading, standard computational provisions then apply in relation to its declared trading profit or loss. The LLP must decide whether its expenditure was wholly and exclusive for the purposes of trade and so forth. For the purposes of a self-assessment of a partnership's trading income, assuming the LLP is transparent, that then flows through to the individual member's tax return. Then when the individual does his own tax return, he states what the partnership is called. It follows that at the stage of challenging the partnership tax return, which is what this is, the on a commercial basis element of trading is not relevant, and therefore it is wholly unsurprising that when Mr. Yates drafted the uh, particulars, he doesn't refer separately to that particular point. Yeah. Um, if necessary, I can quote some transcript. Those are the, those yeah. the points which are, which are made in relation to that. Okay. Um, <coughs> I think oh, there is, so sorry, just Mr. Stewart, it, if it helps, at page 374 of the uh, information memorandum, there is an explanation of the way in which a limited liability partnership yeah. um, yeah. works. Can I, can I just sorry? Can I just um, make, make one other very small point on duty, which I forgot to make. One of the differences between SAD one and SAD two was the identification of Mr. Thornhill as um, tax advisor, not merely to the sponsor but also to the partnership. The LLP had been incorporated. The LLP has been incorporated very shortly before. Of course, the investors were going to become members. So in those circumstances, there was a pretty close relationship between Mr. Thornhill and people who were going to advise, uh, invest on the back of his advice. Um, last point. Last point. Um, my learned friend at the end in relation to reliance and causation said, well, if, if, if there was negligence, a non-negligent QC could have advised that there wasn't much risk. With respect, that's not the relevant, correct legal approach. And you can think about it in terms of the correct approach identified by the House of Lords in Samco. You first of all decide whether an advice is negligent or not. If it's not negligent, that's the end of the case. If it is negligent, it's not a question of the highest non-negligent valuation. It's a question of what the correct advice was. And in my submission here, when you look at this matter fairly, the correct advice was that this scheme was going to uh, be very likely to be challenged by the revenue. They would hate it. That the correct approach was go back to all the facts and so on and so forth and that a challenge was likely to succeed. Conceded that the seeds of what's referred to as the modern approach were already in the authorities. But if I'm wrong about that, the highest it could possibly be 
would be there might be an argument that we can say that Lord um, Templeman has decreed that all foreign partnerships shall be trading. The revenue will be bound to challenge it, but we might get away with it. Uh, and on any view, causation is established on either of those two. What could not be said is that a competent silk, once it's been established that there's negligence, sorry, the correct advice, once it's been established there was negligence, would have been to give the pusillanimous warnings which the judge referred to, and which in my submission are not what the judge finds would have been the correct position, which would have been the relevant test. My lords, my lord, my ladies, um, first of all, thank you for the five minutes. Secondly, uh, apologies for having got up when my learned friend um, kept you don't need to apologize. his time. You don't need to apologize. And third, is there anything we, else? We've all been in this situation <laughs> on your side of the fence, Mrs. Stewart. Can I, can I? On your uh, side of the bar. <laughs> fence is not got right, really. Um, sorry. Um, just before you do, uh, if you, is you have something else you need to say. Well, I've, I've been told I ought to say it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have had a text, you get right. Just try um, uh, the, 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 oh, I think that's the wrong poster. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm prepared to take the risk, my lord. All right, okay. Um, Jolly good. Um, sorry, so can I, I was just saying, is there anything else I can assist you with? Sorry? Can, I was asking if there's anything else I can well, assist Well, what, what I think we're going to do is we're just going to rise for a couple of minutes um, just to have a quick discussion outside just and to tell you not to go. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to make them. Yeah. Mr. Adam, you've got the right of reply on. Mr. Stewart's book. Can I do that now? I'm ready well, to go. I can do that now. And the previous book, which wasn't Mr. Stewart's book. Well, not that big of it, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm always very resentful of Jackson Bell being cited because it's a closed shop. So I have to write for a rival publication and then they steal all my material. <laughs> uh, that's an occasion of qualified privilege. So <laughs> but, uh, the, the, the point that my learned friend has tried to extract from Jackson Bell really takes neither him nor you any further. Because what it actually established by the time it got to the end of it was that this is a factual question. Nobody disputes that a, a professional making their advice available, whether it's through an information memorandum or in any other situation, may be liable because they may assume responsibility on the terms of it. Uh, nobody's saying that that's not the case. But my learned friend said, well, they, if, if they do that, they've got to make it plain they're not assuming responsibility. And that's the issue here. That, that is exactly the question. And I'm not making any submission that NRAM has altered the law at all. It, it hasn't. As, as it happens, it, what NRAM has done is helpfully categorise the, the, the test. It said, so you, you, your lordships and, and your ladyships know that um, the, the, the assumption of the responsibility test has been in and out of fashion for a long time. And the Supreme Court has said, enough. This is the test in this situation. So that's its, its real value, added to which its categorization of reasonableness, reliance on reasonable foreseeability. But because it itself is not a disclaimer situation, the, the, the solicitor who wrote the negligent email didn't put anything at the bottom about you can't rely on it or anything. So the disclaimer point doesn't arise in it. But since Headley Byrne, since the liability was invented, people have been able to disclaim liability. And the, the world does not end as Mr. Stewart suggests it would, because this is a prospectus. The world will not end if it is decreed in London in 2023 that people who are issuing an information memorandum or any other offer document can perfectly, properly disclaim liability. That is not a revolution. It happened in Innovator One. It happened in the Goldman Sachs case, which is in the bundle. It happens in the city of London literally every day of the year. That's what people do. Now, often it's a regulated situation, in which case the statute, the regulations, will make clear the extent to which liability can be disclaimed. That's not this case, because it's accepted we're outside any statutory regime. So there's no magic in it being a prospectus. There's no magic in it being an information memorandum. Jackson Powell doesn't say differently. Very good. Right. Well, we will just rise for a couple of minutes. Um, so don't go away.
budget. Are we going to sweep the sweeps thing? What? What's it going to get on back? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not. I want to throw away sponge things. I to hear that we don't require any further <laughs> assistance. <laughs> um, obviously we're going to reserve our judgments. Uh, we won't we won't give you any warranty as to when you'll get get them, except I think I can say with confidence that it will be after Easter. <laughs> um, thank you all very much for uh, your excellent submissions on both sides and we uh, fully realise it's not just the leaders, it's the juniors and the solicitors as well. It's always a team effort. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you to whoever was responsible for getting uh, Opus 2 to come very quickly <laughs> to sort me out for the rest of the day. That was very helpful. Um, when you get the draft judgment, it'll be in the usual, um, on the usual basis. Uh, the Master of the Royals is always very keen that I remind counsel in court and remind the parties in court about the embargo and the terms of the embargo. And I'm sure you all know that and we'll pay attention to that. And also um, that the whole point of having a judgment in draft is for you to give us any typographical or howlers or whatever, not to invite us to reconsider our decision. Tempting though that sometimes is, but uh, please don't do that. And if, if when the time comes you can agree a draft order between you,
Thank you all very much. Thank you. I'm very grateful to the, the call for sitting late and the call. No, not at all. Can I just say to the clock, I'm, I'm, yes. I hope you have an inconvenience you most. No, thank you very much. Thank you.